Think about how stupid this is, okay? If chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption overwhelms the body's defenses and eventually results in diabetes, sometimes early in the process, sometimes late, depending on genetics, now you're putting somebody on drugs and telling them they have to eat sugar, which is the primary cause of the problem, and then you're putting them on a whole ton of medications to force the body to try to remove the sugar from the bloodstream, either by peeing it out or by ramping up insulin or even injecting insulin. Think about how ridiculous that concept is. But it's based, if you understand where, where the endocrinologists of the day are coming from, upon the misguided, erroneous information that the human body has to have sugar. So, Dr. Robert Sywis, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. It's grateful to see you, man. Yeah, it was good to see you, you well. at uh, Low Carb USA. We both spoke there. You gave a phenomenal talk. We'll talk a little bit about I appreciate your that. talk. And you're doing a lot of great work. Um, I love what you're doing. You have over 20 years of clinical experience. Correct. And before you got into that, what is your story? like? How did you get involved with what you're doing today? Well, as your story, it's personal for me. Um, I topped out around 300 pounds. I've lost about 90 pounds 20 years ago and have kept that off doing the same methodology. And, you know, in the days when we started this, I really took care of my first patient in 1999 at Vanderbilt. And um, I recognized, uh, and I'll go do some of the backstory, the connection with carbohydrates and really not from a dietary perspective, but as a toxic drug. And my behavior was certainly much more aligned to someone that was addicted to, to, to a drug rather than someone who was just overeating. My whole world um, was taken care of with my access and consumption and thinking about and, and surrounding myself with sugar and starch. It's a, once you open your eyes to it, it's pretty powerful, but most addicts are immune to even recognizing how bad things are you know you will you ask a smoker how many cigarettes oh just five cigarettes and you count them it's usually 20 and i recognize that about myself but i also started treating my first patients in 1999 bob adkins was one of the leaders in this dr adkins and um i i recognized the value of what he was doing the difference in my opinion was that he was focused on the nutritional side the uh the eating and drinking side and got maligned for that um, and I rapidly recognized this was a substance abuse problem, not a food problem. And when you take carbohydrates away, if that's 80 plus percent of what you're eating, sure, you leave a nutritional deficit, but then you've just got to construct a diet that doesn't involve carbohydrates, whether that's more on the vegetarian side or more on the carnivorous side. We're figuring some of that stuff out now, but the issue was this drug called carbohydrates that somehow got entangled in our food system. Uh, you know, you might as well just sprinkle some heroin on your food and say that's okay. So that was a piece of it, and that was personal. It was also the frustration. I'm a pediatric surgeon. I take care of a lot of children, and the frustration of seeing 12, 13, 14-year-old kids come in with gallstones that we knew were related to not the consumption of fat, which was the conventional thought process at the time, but really that it was sugar being converted to fat. And as a byproduct to that uh, was the cholesterol side. So these were sugar. This was the first price that these were, kids were paying for their relationship with carbohydrates. So that was the first thing. Um, but we didn't have a mechanism for taking care of their obesity. These kids had come in. They'd be three, four, five hundred 500 pounds sometimes, 14, 15-year-olds. We'd take the gallbladders out, but we couldn't help them uh, with the or or original problem, which is their their obesity. And that's actually not even the original problem. So I became intrigued in that personally as well as with this, but I had a backstory to that. I did my PhD in Toronto, so shout out for any Canadians that are out there, still love uh, Canada, and we'll probably be up in Ottawa in September next year doing another talk up there. However, um, uh, in my PhD, it was done with a guy uh, on my committee called David Jenkins. Now, who's David Jenkins? In 1981, he published the work on the glycemic index. He is the father of the glycemic index. Really good guy, but so wedded to that ideology. Uh, remember, Toronto is the place where Banting and Best work. They, uh, that's where insulin was first discovered just over 100 years ago. So has a long, long, strong history with sugar and insulin and diabetes, especially type 1. However, I worked in a lab where I was a liver transplant lab, and we were dealing with livers that after transplant failed immediately. And we didn't understand it. It was a huge problem. About a third of the livers were not functioning right after transplant. And obviously, the folks were dying. 
So we did a lot of research in the lab, and part of the thought process was that livers didn't have enough sugar. They didn't have, because the thought process was that the liver is, like so many people still believe, that the human body is primarily sugar obligate. In other words, the cells prefer sugar as their primary fuel source, which is true if you eat a lot of sugar. But if you don't, the, liver, the human body is actually mostly a ketogenic human body. We're kind of starting to know that now, although most people still believe sugar has to be consumed. So we took these livers in the lab and we isolated them and we, de we initially depleted them of sugar in the donor, put them on a system and rapidly glycogenated them. And we used amino acids or glucose, fructose, galactose. And we thought that the better you could add sugar to them, the better they would function after transplantation. And what we found was, yeah, that was true for a little bit. But pretty quickly, these livers performed really badly. So the, f the, the, the larger the amount of sugar in the liver, and the sugar was even becoming fatty, uh, so you got fatty liver. And fatty liver doesn't come from the consumption of fat. That's a garbage thing. I can make a fatty liver in three hours on a circuit just by infusing sugar and insulin. Um, and we became really good at that. But nevertheless, we found that... Um, the livers that were best glycogenated performed the worst. And we couldn't figure this out. It was absolutely, completely the opposite to our hypothesis. So when we then went back in and we looked under the microscope at the vascular, we chopped up these livers and looked at the vascular supply to these livers, what we noticed is if you look at a healthy liver, well, any organ, any blood vessel in the human body, the endothelial cells, the cells that line the blood vessels, should look like fried eggs. They should be flat, uh, lining the blood vessel, which means that if they're flat, the lumen is the widest open, so blood can go through very quickly under low pressure. We'll link that to hypertension in a second. And um, because the surface of that cell is what we call anticoagulant, things don't stick to it. It's got this nice, almost Teflon-like surface to it. Um, blood rushes straight by. And what we found is as we added sugar, one of the concepts about sugar, it's very hydrophilic. It loves water. So for every molecule of sugar, it travels around the bloodstream attached to a molecule of water. Now, that sugar very quickly enters the endothelial cells, enters these cells. So when that sugar enters the endothelial cell, it drags with it a molecule of water. And obviously, a flat thing can't hold a lot of water. So as that high level of sugar enters those endothelial cells and these are in the liver so it's getting that first pass effect the liver hasn't had a chance yet to filter the sugar out of the bloodstream so it's when you're infusing or eating sugar it's the largest concentration of sugar is seen by the liver um it's kind of its job is to manuf is to deal with that sugar so these cells were exposed to extraordinary high amounts of sugar and they very quickly rounded up they became like boiled eggs and the problem with that is number one they narrowed that lumen so it became narrow, and it's R to the 4. The radius decreases by the power of 4. So it's a massive reduction in radius. So now you need higher pressures and, uh, to pump the blood through that. Mm -hmm. And if that goes back to the heart, that is one of the primary sources. There are others, but that's one of the primary causes of hypertension in people on the standard American diet. Okay, It's not idiopathic hypertension. It's carbophilic hypertension. We can talk more about that elsewhere. However... As those cells swell up, a round thing is not this big, wide, spread out flat thing. So it exposes underlying what we call the base membrane when the liver is the, the sinusoids, which is, the, for example, if you look at this, at this um, wall, it's nice and smooth. Underneath this is a rough surface. So uh, if I punched a hole in this wall, now you've got this rough surface. And the body doesn't like that. So the way it heals that, if, if I punch a hole here and, you, here and you come along with some spackle and you smooth it over, the body has its own intrinsic spackle. And the spackle is called the intrinsic clotting cascade. It's a little fibrin clot. So you get this fibrin that plugs the hole where these cells are swollen up and they've separated. And they form this little clot. And what stabilizes the clot are platelets. And the platelets then become in uh, uh, um activated by the inflammatory cascade, they attract white cells. So they're stabilizing the clot. The, the body is trying to protect itself from hemorrhaging. Mm -hmm. And usually, most of the time, that injury goes away and the clot gets uh, absorbed. So there's some pathways that activate the clot and some that take the clot away. That's how the body works. It's the entirety of, of the human body it works on a homeostasis function. It's all cyclical. There's, a, there's an action and a reverse reaction. And we'll talk about that as we talk about diabetes. But this clot forms. 
Now, if the clot continues to stay there, if the injury doesn't get resolved, these cells stay swollen, then the next healing process that's attracted by the white cells primarily is something called LDL. I think a few people have heard of that. Or now the sexy word for that is cholesterol. It's not cholesterol. Yeah, explain what it is. It's LDL is this complex molecule that is the one they treat with statins. So what happens is that LDL molecule, which is LDL is just a truck on the road transporting fat around your body. Okay. So what LDL does is it comes and plugs the hole. So LDL is the spackle that your body's trying to lay down this fat over the injury if the injury stays there. And um, HDL eventually comes along if you're trying to get rid of that clot and kind of remove some of that fat. That's a simplistic way of looking at it, mm-hmm. but it's easily understood, un- understood. So LDL is not causing the injury. LDL is desperately trying to heal the injury. Um, and again, that lends its whole science to the lipid industry and the statin and how stupid it is to take a statin for that injury. Nevertheless, as these clots form, they can bulge into the lumen. And in the very small lumens, in these tight, tiny little capillaries, think of them about being one or two cells wide, that clot plugs the, plugs the blood vessel, the tiny little blood vessel. Um, think of your, uh, the liver, for example, or any organ like a subdivision. You've got all the houses, which are the cells that perform the function, the liver cells or the brain cells or the heart cells. And then you've got little tiny roads that go to each house with a little cul-de-sac. Well, think about a bunch of garbage that gets poured out into the road that blocks the road. Now you can't get downstream. So you can't get food and oxygen downstream to those little cells and eventually those cells die. And that was the injury we saw under the electron microscope um, based directly upon sugar. So as you infuse sugar into into the liver, one of the endothelial cell injuries is that swelling. Now in the larger vessels, what we saw is these clots forming and they bulge into the lumen. The, the lumen is fairly wide, that it's, it's wide, so they can bulge into the lumen. But the problem is there's still blood flow, but now it's turbulent blood flow. And these clots are activated, and guess what happens? The clots can break off. And if they then go, go downstream, they can plug the branches of the vessels and again cause the same effect. Why is that important? Because that process is called diabetes. That is what diabetes is. And it doesn't take a lot of blood, a lot of sugar to slightly elevate your sugar to the point that these injuries are happening all the time. So when you think of diabetes, there are two primary end results of diabetes. The first one I call dying in pieces, which is where the tiny vessels, the capillaries of every organ that gets supplied by blood, the brain, the eyes, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, Um, the erectile uh, function organs, your peripheral vasculature, everything gets blocked by those little clots. And that's why people have amputations. That's why people have dialysis. That's why people go blind. Uh, The body's very resilient, but that is diabetes in the microvascular side. On the bigger side, these big blood clots can break off. And actually, that's a little bit more complex because those same same clotting things are happening in the arteries because the arteries actually have little blood vessel networks. So the arteries themselves are getting damaged. They form these bigger clots. And when those break off and travel downstream, there's your heart attack and your stroke. Mm-hmm. And we were talking before this that that was one of the things that happened with your dad. Mm-hmm. That is a direct consequence of chronically elevated blood sugar. And here's what people don't understand. I'm Right now, I'm fat adapted. So uh, I'm living on ketones. I can smell it. I can taste it. I can feel it. Um, if you melted my body down right now, there's about four to five grams of sugar in my entire bloodstream, which is enough to keep the cells that need sugar alive. Four to five. Four to four or five grams, yeah. one level teaspoon, mm-hmm. okay? If I was sitting next to a guy that was an undiagnosed rampant diabetic, let's say his blood sugar is 200, he doesn't know it, and I get a lot of my patients come in here and they have no idea they have diabetes. What do you think the difference is if I melted him down and extracted all the sugar. How much, if I'm at five grams, how much sugar is there in his whole body to really define the difference between someone who's in fat-adapted ketosis and someone who's in rampant, out-of-control, almost diabetic ketoacidosis? What do you think the difference is? Tenfold? He probably has about 5.5 to 6 grams of sugar in his blood. It literally is half to one gram difference. Really, it is an inc- and I learned this from Eric Westman. It is an incredibly, incredibly small difference, and that's what people don't understand. I mean, if you look up there, there's a picture of an apple. That apple has 25 to 30 grams of sugar in it. Oh, but it's natural sugar. 
no, it's a six-sided carbon molecule called glucose or a slightly different one called fructose. It doesn't matter how it goes in your face. Like the apple or the donut, it's exactly the same. The point is, that's a five-fold increase in my blood sugar should I eat that apple. Hmm. So, so the cool part about that is think about how incredibly resilient the human body is to be able to take that sugar very rapidly out of the bloodstream. Now, what we're talking about there is peripheral blood. Obviously, the blood going from your intestine to your liver it, the concentration is much higher, okay? Got it. However, that's a very short distance. The portal vein is about this big. I operate on it on a regular basis. So that just tells you how amazing the liver is. But eventually, the liver becomes overwhelmed. And the liver's job is primarily to take that sugar out of the bloodstream, store a little bit as glycogen, and then turn the rest to fat. But when the liver l loses that protective function, now some of, that the, some of that sugar spills over into the peripheral blood, and that's diabetes. When someone gets fat, you can pretty much see every pound. Diabetes, you only see when it's an irrevocable end result. Mm. Your toes are off. You're on dialysis. You're blind. You don't see diabetes until the damage is irrevocable. And that's why it's such a devastating disease. Does that make sense? Yeah, because when you, they diagnosed it by having an A1C of 6.4 or higher. So what's, what's, what's the flaws with that? What's the flaws with the conventional approach to looking at diabetes? Well, I think the, the first flaw is nothing fixes diabetes. All these drugs just slow down the... Pr the pr think about how stupid this is, okay? If chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption overwhelms the body's defenses and eventually results in diabetes, sometimes early in the process, sometimes late, depending on genetics... Now you're putting somebody on drugs and telling them they have to eat sugar, which is the primary cause of the problem, and then you're putting them on a whole ton of medications to force the body to try to remove the sugar from the bloodstream, either by peeing it out or by ramping up insulin or even injecting insulin. Think about how ridiculous that concept is. But it's based, if you understand where, where the endocrinologists of the day are coming from, upon the misguided, erroneous information that the human body has to have sugar. That's crazy. And the diabetics have to eat sugar. Uh, so the, the, the point is that if you don't have those carbohydrates going in, you're not going to have the type 2 effect. And the type 2 effect is that vascular effect. Okay. Now, let's, let's focus on something else. Okay. What is the difference essentially? I mean, there's obviously a lot of differences, but what is the primary difference between a type 1 diabetic and myself? And this is what most type 1s don't understand. What's the difference? The only difference is you get your insulin from food. They get it, they no, get for, it from a needle. Right. I get my insulin from my pancreas. Your pancreas. Yeah, excuse sorry, me. Sorry. Yeah. That's my pancreas, I mean. and they get it from a needle. A needle yeah. Now, obviously, if, uh, nobody knows exactly how the pancreas functions. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredibly complex uh, structure. So uh, a, a type 1 diabetic can never, ever, even with an insulin pump and a CGM, quite give themselves exactly the same... Uh, uh, insulin as I can, but they can do a pretty darn good job. You know, the way I look at type 1 diabetes and myself, it's a little bit like raising a kid on breast milk versus a ketogenic formula. Mm. Pretty darn close. The baby gets, gets raised fine, but one is slightly better than the other, obviously. Yeah. However, here's the key thing. A tightly managed type 1 bet diabetic should not have the injuries that we see commonly in all type 1 diabetics. And the reason they shouldn't is because if you manage your blood sugar very tightly and you can control that fairly well, you don't have insulin resistance. It's not diabetes, type 1 diabetes, the lack of insulin that causes the problem. It is chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption that eventually leads. The first mechanism of defense of the human body is resistance. So if the body protects itself by resistance, then it doesn't matter what the source of the insulin is. And if you're telling a type 1 diabetic they have to eat tons of carbohydrates all the time, and I get type 1s coming in here that are, that are consuming 1,500, 2,000 uh, grams of carbohydrates a day, okay? Very, very difficult to stay at 50 or 75 per meal, and then they have to have snacks, so they never get any ebb and flow. There's no period of time where they're really not full of sugar. And slowly over time, the way their body first protects them is to become resistant to that insulin. 
And then what happens, you get these wide fluctuations, but their blood sugar, they're afraid now of going low because they're overdosing with insulin, so they tolerate a slightly higher blood sugar. Remember I said it doesn't take a lot. So maybe my average blood sugar is 80. But most diabetics, most endocrinologists are thrilled when a type 1's uh, baseline blood sugar or average blood sugar is 110, 120. That's diabetes, guys. That's type 2 diabetes. So over time, the injury for a type 1 occurs because of the type 2 effect, because of insulin resistance. So I don't like the word type 2. I just like the word insulin resistance because the damage happens well before you get to an A1C of 6.5. In fact, what's interesting is A1C specifically is injury to red blood cells because they've been floating around in this pool of sugar. They, they get glycosylated, they get damaged. So um, that's the first measure of damage to the human body. So I, I think we have to really, if we're going to effectively treat diabetes, whether it's a one or a two, we really have to uh, understand how the body protects itself and how we force the body to have to protect itself by trying to injure it all the time and then how it gets overwhelmed. So I think it's not going to happen through endocrinology. It's unlikely to happen through the ADA, although the ADA is rapidly shifting to understand with the pressure of people like you and me that actually, you know what, you can treat diabetics without sugar. But it's gonna, too many people are going to die over the next 20 years before we understand this. You know, if we rely on the tobacco company to tell us that cigarettes are bad, and it's the same problem. We're relying on people who are dependent on the diabetic manufacturing industry to tell us not to eat sugar. And that's, that's crazy. That's like Philip Morris telling people they shouldn't smoke. It's, it's counterproductive, you know. Uh, just statins, for example, I read an article in December of last year from the British Medical Journal that the sale of statins in 2020 is going to be one trillion pounds. How the devil do you convince people that statins are unnecessary? Uh, it, it just boggles our mind in that regard. Um, so uh, the only way really to do this is to get the word out ourselves. And what I tell my patients is, look, look don't believe anything I just said. Don't believe anything I said, because I could be making this up as much as the endocrinologists are. They've got no foundation for what they're telling you. Um, I can tell you that we do have a foundation, but you may not see or believe that. But do the experiment. Do the experiment. Work with a doctor who understands deprescribing insulin and see whether over a 90-day period you can begin to control your blood sugar better, whether you're a 1 or a 2, by deprescribing insulin and then not not over sorry by deprescribing carbohydrates and then lowering your insulin or your other medications so that you don't go low and the only way unfortunately that we should be able to do this and here's another just it boggles my mind that we're so worried about diabetes and yet nobody can get their hands effectively or inexpensively on a CGM, a continuous glucose mm -hmm. monitor. Yep. You really cannot mon manage a type 2 diabetic or a type 1 without a CGM, and ideally a type 1 on an insulin pump. And yet, because of the FDA, because of the economics, these things are so ludicrously expensive, we cannot afford them. I just so wish that a company like Apple or Google could make a CGM like they make a Fitbit. Fitbits you can buy everywhere, anywhere, all the time. And a Fitbit is just a biological monitoring thing. But it costs less than 100 bucks. Right. Okay? And Fitbits don't really save a lot of lives. CGMs save lives. But here's what they've done. They've connected CGMs to the insulin pump. And therefore, they're medical-grade devices. We have to disconnect that. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you this. Even forget about diabetes. The single best feedback instrument for someone trying to lose weight is a CGM. The single worst instrument is the scale. Yeah, because you can eat a tub of ice cream and the scale can go down. Right. You can do a twenty-four hour fast and the scale goes up if you don't eat enough salt. Okay. Um, but as soon as you put the first spoon of ice cream into your mouth, your CGM is alarming if you set the rates properly. So it's a tremendously powerful feedback tool, and yet they're prohibitively expensive. Yeah, you know the CGM is not re readily available, like you said, and a company like Apple, even like Aura, a company like that could really be a game changer for people because what I think it does, my perspective is it brings them awareness of what food is doing to them instantaneously and what stress is doing to them, right? And, and like you had mentioned in a previous uh, podcast, 
you put on your running shoes and you see your CGM go up, right? Your glucose goes it's up. It's supposed to do that. That's my body doing what it's designed to do. Yeah. And the point is, I know I'm putting my shoes on to go for my run, so I can ignore, I can say, hey, that's cool. And, and you know what actually it does? And, and here's what's so beautiful about even a scenario like that, is that I can tell myself subconsciously or psychologically, hey, I've just got a shot of sugar. Thanks, liver. And I can probably push my run a little bit faster, a little further, because I know I'm not going to bonk. I know something's not going to happen. So psychologically, it improves my function when I see that. But but it, it's a the, the feedback is so cool. And if the feedback is disparate, I can say, okay, what the hell did I do? Well, I ate this thing that I shouldn't have eaten. That's a problem. So you know, I can if if an alcohol, alcoholic had a breathalyzer immediately available, mm-hmm. it listen, it's still an addiction but it might help them to say, hey, this is a problem. Or at least it may curb, and they're doing this, it may curb uh, drunk driving. You know, they've made uh, um, Narcan free for heroin addicts because it saves lives. I don't expect a CGM to be free, but CGMs will will save so many more lives than free Narcan ever will. You know, about 63,000 people died last year of heroin overdose. And that's awful. That's a tragedy. But I would tell you in one month, double or triple that number of Americans died of carbohydrate toxicity. And nobody batted an eyelid. And, and we really haven't begun to focus on this as a toxic drug. So you, you talk a lot about the body being a complex system, and I agree. There's a lot going on. You just explained it so so well. You also bash, and I agree with you 100% about this calories in versus calories out approach to health and weight loss. And explain your thoughts on this whole concept that a calorie is a calorie. Well, I don't, I don't, I try not to bash anything. I'll leave that up to people who've got an ax to grind. For me, it's more just educational. And I understand where the calorie system came from, okay? Um, and, and the way I look at it is this way. And I, I talked about human biology, the, the word homeostasis. It's a big, complex uh, word, but what it basically means is feedback. And the way the human body works is it works in a system of complex cycles. So for every action, there's an there's a, um, equal and opposite reaction that controls things. So as things start to get out of hand this way, it comes back this way. I, I, the simplest uh, um, feedback control system is your car. If you've got a brake and a gas pedal, they're equal and opposite. So usually we use them opposite to each other. If you're sitting there with your foot in the brake and the foot in the gas, that's ketoacidosis. Um, We can explain that in a second. So the human body works in those cycles all all the time, but it only works in those cycles to control things that are vitally necessary for human survival and human function. If something's not necessary for human survival or function, it doesn't have a feedback system. Does that make sense? Yeah. And actually the cool thing about the human body is if you step back and back and back, the systems are very complex at the, at the interface level, but at the origination, they're very simple. So the human body is so cool that it'll use one molecule to create a whole variety of different downstream effects. And then all of those are controlled at a, at a fundamental level. So think about a, a one control tower that controls all the flights in Atlanta and in the surrounding area. It's really, really cool. But nevertheless, when we talk about uh, homeostasis and that feedback control, it only works when something's vital to human survival. So, for example, water, okay? It is ridiculous to tell people to drink water. Uh, it's, okay, I mean, I, what I mean is, yeah, you should drink water, but to tell people how much and when to drink water is ludicrous. You know why? Because your body knows. And as long as you've got access to water, it will never allow itself to get terribly thirsty or never is probably a strong word there are very rare normal healthy instances where the body doesn't it's certain of my operative patients that uh, the thirst signals get messed up but the point is the body knows when you're thirsty it's a miserable feeling if you've got access to water you drink and at some point a signal goes backward that says stop and there's no need for some mathematical formula to quantify how much we drink so where did the whole drink- wait wait but let's get there we're gonna get there so but when you drink alcohol Okay? Alcohol is not necessary for human survival. So there is no stopping point. If I decided tonight after this interview, I, I've had a rough interview, I'm going to drink 12 beers. I can. I've done that experiment. There's no way I can drink 12 bottles of water. My body won't let me. It's that simple. 
okay? So because there's no feedback control for alcohol, I can drink it to excess, but we human beings are smart. So we created a mathematical formula to quantify how much it's safe to drink. Does it always work? No. But for the most part, it controls how much I can drink without doing excess. Mm -hmm. Now, you asked me about calories. Exactly the same principle applies. The human body really has no need to know how much you should eat. It's got plenty of signals when it comes to food that is essential to human biology feedback systems. And there's a whole series of hormonal interactions down the intestine and from the fat cells when you're eating primarily saturated fat that mediates satiety. There's also nerves called eagles, E-G-L-E-S, receptors in the stomach lining that are nerves that go down. So one is hormones. What is a hormone? It's a chemical that travels in the bloodstream to the brain. A nerve is a direct electrical conduit to the brain. So these stretch receptors in the stomach, as the stomach stretches, irrespective of what stretches it, over time it sends a signal to the brain. Those are the two separate forms of satiety, one hormonal, one nerve. And it, the, the uh, satiety signal is primarily uh, mediated by saturated fat. Okay? Um, when it comes to carbohydrates, we've said before that except in very rare circumstances like children in the first year or two of life, carbohydrates are unnecessary for most people, for most humans to consume. So therefore, there is no feedback control with carbohydrates. So you can eat a steak, a big ribeye steak, and as soon as, it doesn't matter if you, it's 8 ounces, 10 ounces, 12 ounces, you don't have to know how much. If you've got enough, at some point your body will say stop, and very, very few people two minutes later will be sitting with an extra little bowl of steak picking at it. Once you stop, you're full, you stop. You're not sitting in front of the TV 10 minutes later eating steak. But two minutes later, you can eat carbohydrates. You can sit in front of the TV with a bag of chips and eat it, even though you're stuffed with steak. The point is there is no feedback control for the consumption of carbohydrates. So way, way back, smart human beings, um, way, way back, became farmers to secure our food source, and we started farming grains. Mm -hmm. And we had to slowly over time, I mean, this is in Greek days, in, in way, way back, um, we started to develop a system to quantify how much it was safe to eat. And that was based on portions. But how do you calculate a portion? You look at the food you're eating from a thermodynamic perspective. So if 100% of what you're eating is uh, uh, a calorie, what are calories? Calorie is, uh, and I forget the exact number, but it's, a, it's the um, grams of energy that are required to raise body temperature by one degree, I think it's Fahrenheit or centigrade. I, I've got to relook at that formula, but it's a specific mathical, mathematical formula that discusses heat. Right. So the first assumption is that all, ca all calories, everything you eat, goes toward energy. That's the first erroneous assumption. And the second thing is to try to quantify how much energy, try to predict how much energy you're going to need between this meal and the next one. That's how ludicrous it is. Okay, mm -hmm. So first of all, it's an irrational system, but the purpose of the calorie system was to try to quantify how much it was safe to eat. And for the most part, we got that right. The, the flip side problem to that is that you and I may be different uh, uh, sizes or we may have different needs on certain days. The caloric formula doesn't account for that. The second thing that we do is we imprint on children's, in children's minds how much they need to predict that they need to eat. So pretty much all human beings in their brain have an idea when we're hungry about how much we think we should get in. And we, that's based on, cal on calories, usually 2,000 calories or some ridiculous formula. And we prepare that amount of food. Now, if there are significant carbohydrates, 60 plus percent of carbohydrates, no matter what the, what the feedback stopping points are, we can finish the plate. So the errors are the preparation of food based on our minds, and then the consumption of that food flow was gone, irrespective of whether I was full or not, because you can override those gastric distensions. Very few people actually get full. I'm stuffed. At least there are some people that do, and those are the people that never get in trouble with obesity. A guy like me, I'm never full. So quantifying calories becomes a system, and we become ing ingrained in that. Okay, And I'll come back to the predictive nature of how much we think we need when it came to the treatment of diabetes, because that's also a mistake that we've made. Um, but what happens then is we sit down, we overeat this food, and if it's carbohydrates, all of that gets distributed, or a large part of it gets stored as fat. And then if eating over and over again, that becomes a problem. 
On the flip side, if you eat a ribeye steak, those satiety signals don't come from the gastric distension. They come from the fat as it goes through the intestinal body. Incretins, a guy called Gabor Edosi does a great podcast uh, on the incretins. GLP-1, which we actually use in diabetes, GLP-1 agonists. Right. Um, uh, to trigger, yeah. collect, all of CCK, peptide, YY. Yeah. Those are all the things. And then leptin in the fat cells. And remember, fat gets absorbed directly into the, into the systemic bloodstream. Fat travels up the gut through the lymph into a vessel here and goes straight to the fat cells. Does not, first pass is not exclusively through the liver like it is with other uh, uh, um, with protein and, fa and, and sugar. Mm -hmm. So the point is that the satiety signal is based kind of on a queasy feeling. The problem is that human beings have not been raised to feel that. So we don't understand that feeling. And you put someone on a ketogenic diet right away, they start, okay, no more carbohydrate, I'm just going to go carnivore. They feel like crap because their brain is still wired to eat the amount they thought they needed in a predictive value. Now, if you're eating a bunch of fat, you feel terrible and you feel queasy and you feel miserable and screw that, this diet's not for me. Or alternatively, and this is the mistake that I think a lot of keto evangelists make, is they free fat. In other words, we don't, uh, uh, we believe that fat is free for the diet and like Texas, the bigger the better. Mm -hmm. The more you eat, the better. So. People are not fat loading their food, increasing the percentage of the food that is fat. They're, they're fat overloading. They're sticking MCT oil in their, in their coffee. They, they, it's co a cream and a little bit of coffee. And mm -hmm. people, again, I apologize for, no, I'm not, you know what, screw that. I'm not apologizing, okay? People are monetizing the ketogenic diet by selling products that are fat fortified. And that is a problem. Not fat fortified, fat overloaded. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's fine to cook your steak and butter. But it's not okay to add a lump of butter to your food and eat basically butter with a little bit of steak attached. <laughs> so you can still, in an erroneous, non-biological way, um, overeat uh, fat calories. But then you feel like crap afterwards. But we're so conditioned to eat the portion. So part of a ketogenic diet is to decondition the amount we believe we need to eat and allow the body to tell you when it's had enough. And the way you do that, the little thing that I've created is called, I call it eating sequentially. So what you do is you don't put any food in front of you. You put the food in the, in the middle of the table. You have an empty plate. You take a, you've got a ribeye steak. Let's say it's a 40 ounce ribeye steak. You cut off one or two ounces. You eat that. And then you say, how do I feel? And you're feeling okay, you go back for more. And I don't care if you finish the whole thing, but inevitably you won't. And my plate's empty, there's still more left, but that's the fridge's food, and back it goes. So what happens is when you eat sequentially, you are not eating in a predictive manner. You're allowing this to tell you how much you need to eat. And if it's got some fat in it, the, the, the best thing to fortify fat is God in nature. And if you eat the animal as it came out of nature, it's probably going to have enough fat on it. Um, maybe deer meat has a little bit less fat on it, maybe... Um, a cow pork has a little bit more, but that's okay as part of the spectrum. The point is that you want to recondition your brain so that it listens to satiety signals, not predictive caloric signals, and don't fat overload, fat fortify. Now, if you look like you, I would tell you to fat fortify a little bit more because you want your fat calories to come from your meals. You don't have a huge amount of fat to give. Uh, I'm a little bit more porky than you are. So as I'm trying to lose weight... Um, lose a little bit more weight, I want to be able to trigger a ketogenic state in my body, but I want most of my fat to come from here, not from what I'm eating. So when people say, well, I tried the keto diet, I lost 80 pounds, and I stopped losing weight, or now I'm gaining weight, it's usually, even though they're not eating carbohydrates, because they're fat overloading, not fat underloading. But that's not a calorie problem. That is a dynamic of misinformation on a ketogenic diet, and it's critically important I believe, to listen to and alter the signals from your body in exactly the same way we treat diabetics. Because the endocrinologist will tell you the way that you give yourself insulin is you predict in a meal how much carbohydrate you're going to eat, and then people have got these tables yep. as to how many grams of carbohydrate, but it doesn't matter if it's a potato or ice cream, a little bit, but with glycemic load or glycemic index, and then you predict how much insulin you need, they call it to cover what you're eating. How ludicrous is that? 
It's crazy. It's I re- crazy. I remember when my dad was w- had his type 2 diabetes and he was prescribed insulin. And they they also said, hey, you know, take him grocery shopping. Here are the items to get him, like Fiber One bars. And get these uh, these Krispy Kreme donuts just in case his insulin drops or his glucose drops too low. And, right. it's, you know, I accepted that back then as, okay, you know, they, they know what they're doing. They have their white coats. Uh, I no longer am now a free thinker. But what you said is very important because a lot of people go into keto. And I see this all the time. I'm not hitting my fat macros. I'm not getting my percentage. And I said, hey, you got body fat, right? Because that fat could come from that plate of food or that, you know, whatever it is, the MCT oil, or it could come from your body fat. It's really your choice. So that's something a lot of people don't understand. They think they have to stuff themselves, like you said, and overload themselves with fats and drink all these oils. And they get a stall and they say, hey, this diet didn't work for me. And which is another thing that I talk about. I know we align with this is that keto is not even a diet. It's a metabolic state. Correct. It's a process that we tap into that's been around forever. If you could expand upon that. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, we'll go there. And, uh, yeah, let's go there. Um, the origination of human beings biologically and as we function and really because there's so much can I use a medical word? Yeah. Okay. There's so much bullshit in <laughs> nutrition science. Um, I, 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 there's no, I don't have a better word, unfortunately. But, but there's so much garbage because it's biases being supported that the best place to go to is to understand the complexity of human biology. That, for me, is, uh, tells a story. And we, we actually understand human anatomy and human physiology really well. The problem is there's always more, no, more dots to connect. However... The way the human body evolved, and I'm going to simplify this just a little bit, is we started out as primarily vegetarian animals, vegetarian primates that lived in forested areas. There was protection in the forest. There was a ready food source, which was a plant-based food source. If you look at the gorillas today, they live in mountainous areas where there's abundant food and water all the time. And what gorillas have, they're eating continuously because there's a very low yield of caloric and nutrient value in a in plants so you have to eat an extraordinary amount and because the process requires fermentation no mammal no mammal can extract sugar from cellulose this this right here is a piece of wood but that's pure cellulose that's that's sugar but mammals cannot extract energy directly from cellulose we don't have the intestinal enzymes to do that so we have this relationship or vegetarian animals, real vegetarian animals, not vegans, have this relationship with bacteria, either in a huge stomach or in their big colon, and the bacteria break the wood or the plants down and extract the sugar. But here's the cool thing. That sugar is not what gets absorbed primarily. A little bit does. But the majority of what those bacteria do is they turn that sugar into fatty acids. And it's the fatty acids that get absorbed in the stomach, in the colon, of those vegetarian animals. So their intestine is very different. They don't have a very long middle gut. The, the, the small intestine is not very long. The gorillas have these huge hind guts, or cows have these four-chambered massive stomachs. Mm-hmm. Anybody that's ever hunted or slaughtered an animal, you know what it looks like on the inside. So... Um, But the problem with that is that even though these are fatty acids and they're energy and nutrients, and the way I divide it is energy is calories and the nutrients are the building blocks of the body, the hormones, the enzymes, the muscles, all the tissues, tissue repair, cell wall, all that kind of thing. That is the nutrient and then energy is the calories that get us to run. So there's a triage both toward nutrition and toward energy of what those animals are eating. However, they need to eat continuously in order to get adequate amounts in. So they're, they're feeding 16 hours a day and pooping all the time. That's what they live to do. Those animals also, because there's a relative, relative deficiency of saturated fat in their diets, um, their brains have not developed very big. They don't need huge brains. They live camouflaged in the jungle. They're eating all the time, pooping all the time, and their brains are small. Okay, Human beings, way, way back, and it's, we didn't just do it. We slowly over probably hundreds of thousands of years, changed to become better and better with our brains. And in order to develop better brain function, we needed a larger source of animal fat. So we started to hunt animals. And we increase, we increasingly became carnivorous. Now, difficult to hunt animals in the jungles. So we started to hunt more and more on the savannas. This is in Africa. And then the other key thing that about humans is if you look at our, ourselves anthropologically, 
we were shoreline animals. We primarily lived on coastlines where we had easy access to water. We had easy access to fish and, and seafood on the shoreline. And I'm not just talking about oceans. I'm also talking about lakes. Mm -hmm. And we also, so we had a steady supply of water. We had access to the animals that lived on the shoreline and to the bigger animals that came down to the water to drink. Pretty smart. And we more and more became carnivores because of that source of animal fat. And the thing that the, human beings are pathetic animals, okay? I take uh, buddies of mine like Zach, Be uh, uh, Zach Bitter, who runs 100 miles faster than I can run one mile, um, and Sean Baker and those guys who are beasts, okay? Danny Vega. The, they're, yeah. But they're pathetic relative to any other animal, okay? Danny Vega's got a huge tattoo of a lion on his arm, on yeah. his, but he's a lamb relative to a to a a lion and i love you danny um <laughs> sean can run it really fast but there's plenty of cats there's not a single cat that can that is slower than sure than, than zach at yeah. least so right. the point is we human beings our bodies even at peak performance are pathetic what separates us out is our brains and our brains need fat and we need animal fat and so more and more human beings evolved to become omni carnivores we retain the ability to use some plants but our primary focus is the carnivorous diet with plants as a backup when you don't have access to a carnivore diet. Now, I can say that about the brain, but the entire human intestine has also evolutionarily transformed. Humans have one of the longest small intestines of the entire world, of, of all the species, because the majority of our food is broken down by enzymes. We don't rely on bacteria. And while understanding the biome, the bacterial biome of the intestine is important, it is far less relevant than I think the attention being spent on it because it's just somewhat unnecessary, for, at least for nutrition. Mm -hmm. There are certain other aspects that the biome is important, but ultimately by the time in humans, food gets to the colon. The only two functions that the colon has in terms of nutritional exchange is salt and water. We have lost our ability in the colon to extract any other nutrients. The only part of our colon that does, the appendix, and mine's in a bucket somewhere. So we are no longer people that can primarily healthily live and extract food from vegetables. We're omnicarnivores. And, in fact, it was interesting. I, li I was listening to Ben uh, Bickman's talk a little bit ago, and he said that one of the, and he's quite correct in this, one of the closest animals that we are intestinally related to are dogs. Hmm. Dogs are carnivores. So, our, you know, if you're going to test um, human biology, and I know I'm a big dog lover. I just posted something on, on my own dog. So I, I have a little aversion to doing experiments on dogs. But when you look at rats and mice and that kind of thing for experimentation, they really don't translate to humans. A rat, rat's diet has to, or a mouse's diet has to be 90% fat in order to get into ketosis. Humans aren't like that. So it doesn't correlate across, and that's part of the nutritional BS, the right. science. But, but dogs reflect that, and the dog intestine is carnivorous. So if you look at human beings, our entire biology is suited more and more to a carnivore lifestyle, from our brain to our gut to all the enzymes and the way they interplay. Um, can you survive on a plant-based diet? Sure, for a while. But to my mind, I don't get my food from GNC. And if you have to supplement your food with pills, you are not on a complete diet. So... That's my take on that. So that's the, the human evolution, the human biology. Okay. Fantastic. Can you take some, some story videos? Uh, I want to get into, before we wrap it up here, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Before we wrap it up here, I want to talk a little bit about your talk at Low Carb USA, Boca, which was a fantastic talk. I got a lot from it. I've never really studied this topic, and I got into it after I heard you speak. Something called a concept or a, an approach called dopamine fasting serotonin loading and you talked about having dopamine resistance so could you explain that a little bit more and what are some activities somebody could perform to re reverse this resistance sure. so so the principle comes from this um if as and i'm gonna be arrogant here and i'm okay being arrogant if you know absolutely that carbohydrates are a drug not a food and that the modern humans while they they, they have a role in both at both arenas carbohydrates are primarily used as a drug by humans you know, opioids have pain receptor functions. I use opioids every day when I operate on patients uh, for medical purposes, but for the most part, they're recreational drugs. Same thing with carbohydrates. So when you get rid of carbohydrates from your life as a toxic drug, 
they are unique in the addiction world that they leave two deficits. The majority of keto people are focused on, when you remove carbohydrates, replacing the nutritional hole that they leave, okay, which is diet and nutrition. And whether it's keto or vegan or whatever it may be, you want to replace adequate spectrum of nutrition with that. We've talked a lot about that so far, mm -hmm. and a lot of disease come from that. But what people don't really understand is the main reason why people overuse carbohydrates is as a dysfunctional relationship with a substance that gives them an instant sense of emotional gratification. So people that did not develop, and more and more in our dysfunctional society, children, human beings are not raised with a diverse functional endorphin emotion management system. So if you have lost or you've got a deficient emotion management system, you build up all this emotional tension. Everybody has anxiety and stress and depression and anger and fear and frustration and boredom and pleasure, boredom's an emotion. And we build up all this emotional tension. And then at a very young age, before you even know that you're human, what's mom giving you? A sugar treat. Yeah. Okay? So she's giving you crystal meth to make you calm down and make you feel good. Actually, it causes ADHD, according to Leon Eisenberg, the guy that described it, be that as it may. Um, we become addicted to sugar and starch. Or we become abusers of sugar and starch at a very young age. And the difference between abuse and addiction is the amount of harm it causes. So pretty much everybody in America abuses sugar and starch. Some people have an addiction. And the people that have an addiction are people that were not raised or have lost the diversity of emotion management systems. So what we look for is people that have a vulnerability to addictive behavior look for instant gratification, an instant high and they'll pay the price on the back end. When it comes to a healthy emotion management system, you put the effort in up front and the rewards on the back end. So if I've had a rough day today and I come home and I down a bottle of Jack Daniels and I pass out, or I eat a tub of ice cream and I feel great, I've had that instant gratification, but on the back end, there's negativity, harm, guilt, and most important, repression of the very issues I should have connected with. So I play whack-a-mole with all the stuff happening in my life and I'm continuously looking for something to make me feel good and I develop this excessive relationship that eventually causes harm. Now if on the other hand I come home and I leash up my dog and we go for a walk, that requires effort. That walk is an endorphin experience, relaxes me. Uh, but it requires effort. And while I'm walking, because there's a time component, I can get it up inside my head and process, connect with, and process some of the tough issues that are driving my emotion. So by the time I come back from that walk, number one, I'm feeling good because of the endorphin effect. Number two is I've got an idea of how to handle or deal with or let go of some of the issues dealing with my emotions. And the third part is I'm feeling proud of the fact that I went. So my self-esteem and my self-confidence has gone up a little bit. Okay? That does not describe most people's lives. So most people are doing all these crazy things for instant gratification, whether it's gambling, whether it's sex, whether it is, sex requires some effort sometimes, um, <laughs> whether it is uh, consuming alcohol or drugs or smoking, whatever it is. And our lives become these frenetic things. Even, even this guy being online and stuff, frenetic, 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 and we don't pay the price on the back end. And it just blows up and blows up and blows up. And really what's happening there biochemically in our brains is we are triggering a hormone called dopamine. Now, this is not neuroscience, so don't, don't criticize me on the neurochemical aspects of this. These are concepts. But the hormone called dopamine builds up and builds up and builds up, and we're doing all these things to kind of help us to focus, um, but the problem is it gets out of hand. And every now and then, we just need a reset. And a dopamine fast is the way to completely isolate yourself, to recognize that things have gotten completely out of control, and you just need a day's break. You know, if you're driving your car all over the place, eventually the oil gets old and everything, and the little red light comes on and says your car needs a service. And you take it into the gas station or to the, or to the um, oil change place, and it gets that oil change, and it's refreshed. We human beings are the same. But we never, ever give ourselves a break. We're being productive, and we're using chemicals and drugs, and and we're not paying it down on the back end. A dopamine fast is where we completely isolate ourselves from external stimuli. The, the, these guys in California have this beautiful saying that if you're riding a donkey, the way to ride a donkey or to get a donkey to move is dangle a small carrot in front of it. 
The problem is that if that donkey's been peeing out at a, a carrot buffet for the last week, it's not going to look at your tiny little carrot or move because it's full. Mm -hmm. And that's how human beings are. We are less productive, less effective, and less tolerant, and we don't process stuff because we've been dining at this emotion management buffet of instant gratification, and we don't give, we don't care. I can't use that word. We, we don't care about the downstream effects. So there's a time to have a reset. And the dopamine fast is taking a day, taking an afternoon, and completely isolating yourself. You can drink water, preferably with a little bit of salt on it. It's uh, 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 intermittent fasting, which you're big on. Mm -hmm. And it basically is fasting yourself from consuming any food. You will not die of anorexia for that day. You isolate yourself completely from your cell phone, from external stimuli, from anything that makes you feel good. And I know that's traumatic, but what it does is when you're using things to feel good, you're obliterating the need to connect with the issues that are causing you emotional trauma. So when you remove the carrot buffet, now you're isolated. It's called starving the donkey. And if you starve that donkey for a day, but you get that donkey to sit down and intentionally connect with some of the stuff that's been going on. What's happening in my life? What's happened to my relationship with my wife? I love her dearly, but she's moving this way. I'm moving this way. I used to go for a run every morning. Now I don't. What's happened? Why? And it's a, it's a forced reset because you don't have access to the behaviors and the drugs that numb, soothe, and obliterated those very emotions. So it's a reset. Now, the next day, you want to rebuild. So m the external stuff, the stuff that I've adopted from the Silicon Valley, was the dopamine fast. Mm -hmm. That's necessary. You've got to starve the donkey. And the donkey has to understand what's been happening. But the next day, and this is my stuff, this is something that we've worked on, because I've worked on it for 20 years with my patients, is to serotonin load. Now, serotonin is that thing that relaxes us. So when we're focused, when we're intense, think about driving your car in the rain. Uh, you're driving along and the water accumulates on your, on your windshield and you can't see. And then you hit the wiper and for a second it cleans the windshield and then the water accumulates again. Exactly the same. All this dopamine builds up and a healthy person can focus for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then they give themselves a little serotonin break. Something, hey, right here, there's my serotonin break, okay? That's a sip of coffee, a deep breath. It takes a second, and yet I'm restored. That dopamine has gone down, and now we're going to rebuild it up. So the point is that we've lost track of effective serotonin relief. So on the second day, you start bringing in and doing things that require maybe a little bit of effort up front for that reward on the back end. You go for the walk. You do something charitable. So you do something maybe physically active. Uh, you do something charitable or something creative. It takes time and effort to paint or to sing or to even trivial things. But the reward is on the back end. Um, you maybe reconnect spiritually or have a meditative moment. So you recreate that space. And you may create, recreate empathetic human connection. Maybe you're taking something that you're ashamed of, or something that's been festering inside of you, and you talk to the person about it. You share it. And you know what? It probably is going to go okay, but sometimes it doesn't. But the serotonin loading aspect is developing strategies that require effort up front, create a little bit of a meditative space where you can identify and connect with the issues that are driving your emotions, and then you develop a way of resolving them either by letting them go. I love Warren Buffett's comment. You can always tell someone to go to hell tomorrow. <laughs> okay, just so cool. Because all the time you're fire, go to hell. No. Whew, let it go. Because by tomorrow, it doesn't matter anymore. So you reconnect with healthy ways of, number one, sweeping your own emotions aside, identifying what the issue is, and then dealing with the issue, responding to the issue rather than reacting to the emotion. The way I look at a lot of our emotions is like a piece of cotton. If ever you've been to Georgia and you've seen cotton growing in yeah. the field, it's this hard outer shell. So it uh, pressurizes, and then suddenly it pressure, pressure builds, and it bursts. And all you see is the white fluff, this explosion of white fluff. That's the emotion. Underneath that, if you remove the fluff, what you've got there is a little black seed. 
that is the heart of the matter. That's the issue. That's the thing that's going to become the next seed, the next cotton plant. But all too often we get trapped in this white cotton. And we, you know, can you imagine being stuck in some cotton and you can't move? What you want to be able to do is do a behavior, go for a walk, say a prayer to sweep away the cotton so that you can identify what that little black seed is. And when you sow that black seed, sometimes it grows to a beautiful new cotton plant. Sometimes it forms on bar falls on barren soil. Sometimes it takes a while to germinate. But you become a more effective human being if you've got strategies to do dopamine fasting and then serotonin loading to get rid of the emotion and connect with and identify the little black seed that is the issue. And then you can decide what to do with it. And if you do that, your anxiety, everybody gets anxious, everybody gets stressed, everybody gets depressed, but you can handle it so much better. Your self-esteem grows, your self-confidence grows, you become a better human being. That's fantastic. Such great tips. I, I really hope keto campers do these exercises. I mean, so, something I've been doing over the years are my morning walks, uh, you know, disconnecting from my phone, not even looking at my phone the first 60 minutes, being present, doing my meditation. And I hadn't realized that I'm doing this dopamine fast right. in so a sense. So you're doing like a little mini dopamine fast. Yeah, That's exact, every single morning. Exactly it. Yeah. You know, the, the big day, the full day, I actually take a weekend, a Saturday and a Sunday, maybe once or twice a year or, or three times a year where I can isolate a weekend. But you're right. The right way to do this is as you become better at it, practicing it every day. Whether it's maybe taking half hour or 10 minutes or 15 minutes f as prayer time. Whether it's taking your dog for a walk like I do, uh, or like I think you go for that morning yep. walk. And it doesn't have to be strenuous. It's not about the result. It's about the process. Or just sitting down, maybe after dinner, and instead of having dessert, talking with your wife, talking with your girlfriend in an empathetic way. What does empathy mean? Where you create a space that you can be vulnerable without recrimination, without judgment. And, and really, this office where I work is a way we can help obese or diabetic people to connect with that aspect of themselves. And we create an empathetic environment. I was pretty blunt and straightforward with this talk, but because we know that I'm non-judgmental, I'm non-critical, and that's what I try to foster, we can talk about the issues rather than get caught up in all the emotional fluff. Beautiful. Well, I have my rapid fire questions and then we're going to wrap this up. I really hope you guys are enjoying this. I'm getting a lot out of it and I know my girlfriend is too who's with us. So I have my keto camp rapid fire questions. Uh, we'll go through it and then we'll wrap this up. First question is, what is your favorite keto carnivore food? Lamb. How do you like it cooked? The rarer, the better. A good vet should still be able to resuscitate it. And <laughs> the best lamb I've ever had and I'm not biased in any way, is South African sheep from the mm -hmm. Karoo. It has got thick fat on it. The meat comes from a body. They eat bushes rather than grass. Sorry, Aussies and New Zealanders. Um, but South African lamb, it is so good. Yeah, I'm biased. I'm from there. But yeah, I grew up on lamb. But beef is good. What's any animal, quite frankly, is fantastic. What's the face you're making there? No, just like the description about the fat of the bushes. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds good to me. Uh, what, what's the first thing you think of in the morning when you wake up? The first thing I think of is making my bed. Why is that important to you? And it's a silly little thing, and my patients who know me talk about this well, because I don't make my bed. I pull the covers up. And it's an opportunity to do something that makes me feel good. It is the very first thing I can do that gives me a moment of pride. And, and one of the things I'm really focused on as a fat guy is throughout the day doing what I call action snacks, okay? When I was fat, it was two M&Ms throughout the day that made me feel good, okay? Now I do little action snacks. And the first action snack I have an opportunity to have is to pull the, uh, um, covers. Uh, the covers up. And as soon as I pull those covers up, I just do this, okay? Because... Um, that recognition of self that you put a little bit of effort into something silly in a tiny amount increases my sense of pride. I'm proud of the silly little thing that I can pull the covers up. And in little increments, um, that uh, um, self-pride builds up my self-esteem and self-confidence. And if I've got emotional money in the bank in the morning before I leave the house, I can tolerate and surf over all these waves of emotional animosity that come at me. If I haven't got emotional money in the bank, I'm clashing with it. So if I've pulled my covers up and, and gone for a walk with my dog and I'm driving to work and some asshole cuts me off, I can say, dude, 
you take your bad day with you. I'm backing off. I'm not letting your bad day be my bad day. If I haven't put that emotional money in the bank, then that guy comes past me and I'm giving him the finger and I'm racing beside him and I'm yelling and screaming at him. So ultimately, my entire world, because I'm an addict and I always will have a vulnerability to addictive behavior, has to be to look for putting money in the bank so that I can spend it when I need it. And all too often when we need it, our bank is empty. Yeah, great. Emotional so bank. One of the key things, just to, just to and yeah. this is my little tagline. I was searching for it and I, I lost it for a second in my brain. What making my bed does, it's an opportunity for self-approval. And self-approval is self-care. I'm so unselfish that I let you have that self-approval in the morning because <laughs> she makes the bed. <laughs> Even if she's in it. My <laughs> wife's often in the bed. <laughs> Pull your own side up. Uh, what's the best piece of advice you've ever heard? You know, uh, there's so many. Um, it's a, you put me on the spot. But probably something my father said to me is that a busy person makes the time to be human. Mm. That all too often we sacrifice humanity for productivity. And being kind, being generous, being humble, being a human being has to come first. And the busier we are, the easier it is to slice away bits of ourselves. And the busy person makes time to take care of themselves and take care of those around them. And that's an ongoing lesson for me. I wasn't very good at it when I started this, this life of mine. I'm not going to be great at it by the, on the day I die, but as long as I'm continuously working toward that, there's milestones along that pathway. Yeah, I see you doing that uh, with just my view on you. Wh what is the worst piece of advice you've heard? <laughs> <laughs> go to medical school <laughs> um no probably not i i i am so fortunate with the people that educated me medically i i my entire focus on life my entire uh, uh outlook on healthcare, comes from the people i trained with and they set me up to ask the question why and i think probably the single worst uh, thing that we've done is to transform the question why into recipe book answers for everything, for everything. So um, probably the worst advice I've heard is you don't have to think. Hmm. We human beings, as I've said before, this is what makes us human. And thinking is what human beings should be doing. You're doing a good job of waking people up so they can think. Well, that's that's my roots. And Tim Noakes is one of the people I credit for the most. My physiology teacher. What are we talking about today? Physiology. If you had one superpower, what would it be? Humility. Mm. What was your favorite TV show growing up? Didn't have TV. Best. Now that was the best show. The place where our TV was, was books. That's awesome. I did not have a television in my house until I was 24 and came to the U.S. And guess what? We do not have TV. We've got 13 TVs in the house because they were there when I bought the house. We do not have TV. And it's the most liberal. And I'm not telling people not to watch TV, but it's been one of the most liberating places because the two places we go to hide from our emotions are bed and TV. Mm -hmm. And it gives me more opportunity to interact with my wife, my dog, myself. So, yeah, that's Beautiful. my answer is none. What a blessing. Okay, uh, one more question here for Rapid Fire, then I have my la last question and we're done. Who do you admire most in this world, or actually dead or alive, who do you admire most? Nelson Mandela. Why? Easy. Um, you see, every time I say his name, it's, it's, uh, it's a little emotional. He lived the best life. You know, we hear that saying all the time. This is a guy who intensely believed in what was right and wrong. He was strong. He was a boxer. But he used his mind, his brain, his training, his education. And he always was in every fight that he had. He had the worst of the fights. You think slavery was bad? Slavery was worse in my country, South Africa, because they weren't even paid. They weren't even housed or looked after. It was awful. But Nelson Mandela was a guy that was always humble, always empathetic in the way he handled things. He was strong. But he tolerated and he won. And he converted an entire country. I'm so sorry 
that the legacy that he left in that beautiful country of mine, South Africa, and really for the world, has now been contaminated again by people that are corrupt and people that are using the system for their own benefit. Because if of anything, Nelson Mandela thought about those people around him before he thought of himself, including his prison guards. Can you imagine that, being in prison and having positive feelings toward your own guards? That's the kind of guy he was, and very few of us are like that. So he is absolutely my hero. Yeah, great answer. My final question for you is, when we look out there in the world, a lot of sickness, a lot of people dying from cancer, complications of diabetes, just it's disgusting, right? If you had a magic wand, and with this wand, you get to instill three rules the world will follow three things to apply for every human being to reverse this devastating these devastating stats what would the three things you would put into place be by far by far number one is raising children raising children you see it is the responsibility of parents not to make their children productive it is the responsibility of parents to raise their children with an effective, healthy, diverse emotion management system. And if you look at the surviving first world nations, the hunter-gatherer societies that still exist, who shouldn't exist, the first thing they do before the children are put to work, before the children are forced to be productive, they make them an integral part of the clan. They, they raise them with play, with rest, with that dopamine fast endorphin experience thing so that they can be healthy individuals first and foremost then no matter how much trauma you get from life you can handle it two soldiers go to war they face horrific conditions one comes back with ptsd one doesn't the difference is the emotion management tools they took to war with them so raising our children right and the, the issues with addiction the issues with substance abuse the issues with suicide the issues with all of these societal dysfunctions can primarily stem back to how we were raised so that's the that's the first thing that i would change the second one is a john lennon moment you heard the song imagine mm -hmm. okay all i would urge is for people to go back and listen to the words of imagine and I know there are warmongers out there. There are people that uh, want to stand on the back of other people. But I'm not going to give you one thing. It is the verses of Imagine. And, and I know that will never happen because we're human. But ultimately, the words of, of Imagine are the most important uh, um, concepts that I think we could, as a society, work toward. That's kind of utopian, but it really is, even if we strive toward it, it would be ideal. Mm -hmm. um, and the third is a more pragmatic concept, is Darwin was right. Darwin was right. Darwin talked about successful species. And ultimately, we have to shed the bad part of our species to grow. And pretty much every bit of adversity that has happened to us, that we've done often to ourselves, is part of shedding that species. And as awful it is, as it is, eight, nine billion people on this earth is too much. So somewhere along the line, survival of the fittest has to happen. And it's an awful, awful thing to say, but that's the reality. And uh, more and more what we do to ourselves alters that side of things. So if you really want, to want this planet to survive, it is not about protecting climate change. This, this earth will take care of itself. It took care of itself when a meteor hit us, took care of the dinosaurs. It's going to take care of humans unless we take care of ourselves first. And it is striving to do and be better all the time. That's Darwinism. And those that choose not to, they should be left behind. Well, I really enjoyed this conversation. I want to acknowledge you. Uh, you are really brilliant at what you do. I know my girlfriend enjoyed this conversation as well. Your analogies are on point. You take these complicated topics and subjects and you break it down in really bite-sized ways and analogies for people to understand. And you are humble. Humility is in you. I see it with you. And uh, I really appreciate your time today and you coming on the podcast and just letting me come to your aw awesome office. Where can my listeners and viewers learn more about your information? Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And also oversimplification is not um, dumbing it down. It's explaining it. So I get criticized a lot for, oh, blah, blah, blah. no, it's concepts. 
But the place we try to get these concepts out, my YouTube channel, um, and I'd love for people to subscribe to it, it is free, is Carb Addiction Doc, D-O-C, Carb Addiction Doc. My Instagram is Carb Addiction Doc, and I'm also on Facebook under the same label. But anytime anybody wants to learn more, there's free access to me, not free access, but there's access to me through my office as well. Ultimately, I'm a doctor. This is what I do for a living. Not this, but you're sitting in my office right now and we treat patients individually. I can put the word out there to help people to treat themselves. But ultimately what I've realized is the world's an ugly place sometimes. But one person at a time, one transforming one person's attitude to themselves at a time saves lives. And that's the business that we're in. Amen. So your office is here in uh, West Palm Beach or Palm Beach, Florida. So um, where is is there a number you want them to call? Or yep. I, I'm in Palm Beach, Florida, but I've also got an office in Jacksonville, Florida. And we do a number of counseling uh, sessions online. Whether you've got diabetes, obesity, from an athletic pers- performance perspective, we can do some of that online. When I do it out of state, I don't do it with my doctor hat on. Um, but in, my, in the states I work, New Hampshire, Idaho, um, Florida, and Georgia, um, I can function as a doctor. The uh, number to call is 561. Actually, let me rephrase that. The number to text is 561-517-0642. And if you text, um, somebody in my office will get back to you and we can try to set up a one-on-one visit. Perfect. Well, we'll put all the links and resources that he mentioned in the podcast notes. So go check that out. If you're listening to the podcast and you want to watch the uh, video interview, that's going to be on my Keto Camp YouTube channel. And subscribe to Dr. Cyrus's YouTube channel. Follow him on Instagram. Follow him on his social media. He's doing amazing work. And again, thank you so much for the interview. Thanks very much. Appreciate you. Thank you.